I'm going to list in the description anything that's notably spoilery. Just as a disclaimer, this year we're doing only first-time watches. Last year we did anything that we happened to watch in the year. It doesn't mean it had to have been produced in 2023. We just happened to watch it for the first time in 2023. For the first time in 2023, and possibly the second, third, and fourth time in 2023. I'm so excited to see what that's in reference to. You won't have to wait long. So, Brian, please start us off with your short list of honorable mentions. All right. Uh, and as promised, uh, we're coming around to it right away. My first honorable mention pick is Mithrigan, and or Megan probably, as it's supposed to be called, which is a horror movie, for those who don't know, about an uncanny valley type doll. It's supposed to be like really futuristic, gains sentience, comes to life, starts doing horror nonsense, real slashery, real campy. The reason it's so appropriately placed first on my list is because it was the first movie I saw this year, so once it went into the honorable mentions, I kind of drew that line and thought it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I also saw it, like I mentioned, three or four times, um, at least three times in theaters. One of those was with you, Shannon, actually, I believe as well. Is that right? Yes, and Mithrigan was awesome. It was a PG-13 movie, which makes it really accessible to younger audiences. Kind of makes me think back to, like, Insidious, which was the series that got me and my friends into horror back when we were in high school, and still means a lot to me, despite what later movies might do or different things kind of become. It's still, like, a really neat premise, and I enjoy the thought that younger people and possibly younger women are maybe getting into horror more with this type of movie and possibly, you know, going to generate more horror creators and artists and stuff like that. Uh, second is Evil Dead Rise. We're going to go with a horror theme again trend this year because I am who I am as a person. The Evil Dead franchise is very old and has a couple iterations. Uh, the original is one of my favorites. Our friend Dante and I watched it in a basement on like Comcast On Demand when we were like real young and uh, it really stands out to me. Um, the series as a whole is real campy, real fun, a lot of blood, sometimes in excess. This new one was less fun and a lot more just kind of violent and mean. Don't get me wrong, it's still a great watch. The practical effects were phenomenal. Uh, it's a really cruel cool movie. It kind of convinces you that none of the characters are safe, even the ones who you normally would expect to be. And lastly, my third honorable mention is Yellow Jackets, uh, which is a uh, series uh, with two seasons out right now. I believe five in total planned, about a group of girls, uh, high school soccer players, who crash in the mountains uh, while they're on a trip for a game, along with some of the coaches and supplementary, you know, characters. I'm going to call it a twist on that classic survival style of storytelling, you know, people get lost in the woods or somewhere. I don't think it really does a lot different in that way. What I will say is that it splits a lot of the storytelling between the adult versions of the girls who lived uh, and the actual occurrences of the woods, and I think that's really neat. A lot of people I've heard complain about that, uh, saying that the you know stuff in the wild is obviously a lot more thrilling, it's a lot more engaging. I think it's just kind of a really cool balance. I think the show does a great job of knowing when to you know, bounce back and forth between one and the next. I can't wait for the rest of your top 10 to have absolutely no horror in it. Of course, yeah, no. At no point in time or another was I trying to cut out like seven horror movies from consideration because there were too many. All right, so for my honorable mentions, I wombo comboed a little bit because last year you wombo comboed and I'm cashing in my wombo and my combo. So I felt the same amount of appreciation, weirdly enough, for Wendell and Wild and Pleasantville. Wendell and Wild is like stop motion, produced by Kim Peel, a bit of an analysis on the grieving process, how we grieve, as well as the prison industrial complex, so very interesting. Pleasantville was something I didn't expect to be as deep, but still had some pretty profound moments. That is Reese Witherspoon and Tobey Maguire as teens getting transported into a 1950s sitcom and maybe learning that it's not as pleasant as it may seem. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, next I have the Barbie movie. In terms of movie magic, it had a lot to provide. It was very bright, colorful, break away from all the CGI. And then last but not least in my honorable mentions, I have Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, uh, headed by Alison Brie. I feel like all of the plot points in that were really interesting, but specifically the main two characters, Debbie and Ruth, their friendship was really interesting, had a lot of points of contention, but they ended up exploring that in a very fun way as the like main hero wrestler and the heel. So now that we have our honorable mentions out of the way, Brian, would you like to start us off with your number 10? I get to go first. Do you want me to go first? I don't care. No, I'd love to go first. Oh, please go first. Um... I love talking, obviously. So I think I mentioned before we started, I was excited about two locations of certain movies in the list. Uh, one was Megan, because I thought it was thematic to show up first. 
Uh, the other one in the tenth slot of my actual list is Saw Ten, spelled like with a Roman numeral X. So I don't know. So I've heard people call it Saw X, but I think it's supposed to be Saw Ten anyway. Shannon knows very well that of all the horror movies uh, I'm going to be rattling off today, the Saw franchise is one of my absolute favorites. Um, the original standalone is iconic, maybe top five horror movies all time for me. The series itself is also known for being a franchise and a bit of like an event film, like every year it would come out and it would be this big hullabaloo. The movies tend to get a little more silly as time goes on, but still maintain value in being real goofy and kind of complicated. There's a lot to love about them. I think this was the first time in a while we've seen a bit of a return to form. Now, I have no complaints about some of the more recent movies that have come out in the Saw franchise that I think have gotten a little more controversy around them. Uh, in this particular case, though, Saw 10 was definitely one where I think I'm going to probably throw it up towards like the top half, maybe even top third of my list of the entire franchise. Tobin Bell uh, as Jigsaw and Shawnee Smith as Amanda both make a return to characters uh, that we haven't seen be central figures in the movies for a very long time. It's a bit of a prequel. Um, I think that was part of the marketing, so hopefully that's not like a big spoiler, but it takes place very early in the Saw timeline. The acting is really, I think, fun. Um, you can tell that people are loving the characters are playing and, and really leaning into it. The traps are really gross uh, and kind of, again, fun to watch. Uh, I think just overall, it's not going to be higher on my list because I, I, I thought, again, overall, it was kind of probably towards the middle, maybe top half of the series as a whole. But it definitely was really joyful to go and see an old favorite again uh, in theaters for the first time for me, uh, a Saw movie, and, and that's why it's definitely on the list. Also, when you said that there was an X in the title, I thought you meant they were trying to be cheeky, like with Megan, and that they used that as one of the letters. And I was like, S X W S A X? Like, what? It, it's sax. Tobin Bell busts out with, like, a sick horn band. I would have yeah. watched that. So, what's your number 10? I chose the live action One Piece on Netflix. I've tried watching One Piece a few times. I'm going to be completely transparent. I struggle when tits are, like, at the forefront of an anime. So imagine you take that and remove the excess titty, but you keep the heart. And that's what happened with the live action. And I just feel like the casting was really good. It did a really good job of paying homage to all of the good parts of Shonen. It didn't seem like they were embarrassed that their source material was something so long running and goofy. And because the part that they're focusing is obviously the beginning of the anime, they could have very easily acted like they were better than the goofy aspects of the first like few arcs, but I think they did a good job of paying homage and then both creating their own kind of vibe. So very much a fan, excited for the next season. So for my number nine, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a adaptation of obviously the book uh, taught in probably most literature high school reads that someone has to do. I find that with a lot of war movies, they completely miss the point and kind of become just pseudo-propaganda films for whatever country is making them. In this particular case, they understood the very, very, very important assignment, which is that war's not great. Even if maybe certain revolutions or acts are done, you know, for good reason, the, the existence of war itself is not great, uh, it should not be glamorized or glorified, and this movie's, like, sole thesis, I'm pretty sure, is to show that. You watch these young guys go from being really hyped about, you know, going to, you know, fight for their country to suffering what is just horrors beyond human comprehension. Violence, you know, disease, like this dirty experience of utter misery. And so I guess in a lot of ways, you know, maybe it falls a little bit into that kind of misery porn category, but I don't necessarily think that was the intent. I think the movie was, you know, really doing a good job of kind of adapting source material and acting as a bit of a warning of people who maybe want to kind of glamorize that, especially older wars, like quote-unquote the Great War, World War II, stuff like that. And, you know, overall, I think it was just like, nominated for tons of awards and stuff. Like, it's definitely a well-recognized film. Going on from your very serious movie, I'm going to bring us to Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. I had no plans of seeing this in theaters. I never really saw, I think, the first Puss in Boots movie, which has the crazy-ass egg. But I remember seeing a lot of clips online and the animation was stunning especially when you think this is like a sequel for a supporting character in the shrek franchise the villain was great he had great voice acting very ominous the whistle was creepy the lesson i feel like was pretty good without being too ham-fisted it was essentially about puss in boots having his nine lives kind of learning to recognize his own mortality despite that then there's the whole Goldilocks story about how the real family are the friends who make along the way. And then John Mulaney. I've actually never seen 
any of John Mulaney's comedy. I've only known him as a voice actor, but he killed Jack Horner. This was done really well, but again, similar to like what I said about One Piece, it doesn't seem like they were trying to be better than their audience or be deeper than a kid's movie. It was still perfectly fine being a kid's movie, and I think that's important. It was a little romp. What You've said romp like three times. What does that mean? Like a romp, like a, like a frolic. Uh, a what? fun little adventure through the... Uh, you know what? Oh. Hold on. I'll, I'll, see, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will search ROM on the internet and just tell you what it says. So, hmm. To run or play in a lively, carefree, or boisterous manner. I guess Puss in Boots was a ROM. All right, Brian, can you please take us away to number eight? Number eight is Midsommar, which is a fun little romp. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's terrifying. Uh, <laughs> it is a movie that I watched kind of in tandem with Hereditary this year. Um, I know that a lot of people love Hereditary. I also thought it was very good. Um, I'm not including it in my list. I think Midsommar definitely resonated with me a lot more just because of how unsettling it was. You'll probably see from both my past selections and future selections that horror movies that are a little bit more on the physical side or ones I've gravitated towards over time. You know, slashers, what people like to call torture porn or like kind of things like that. In this particular case, it's very much more of a movie that's based around just making you feel uncomfortable. A group of college students, I believe, go to their one exchange student slash friends to his hometown uh, where they are riding this fine line between being respectful of the culture and being like, oh, some of this seems a little bit cult-like and, you know, how much of that is real and how much of it is it, you know, them being kind of just unfamiliar with that type of thing. And, you know, the more and more the story goes on, the more and more everything kind of starts to unravel. I think that the, what really also sold me on this movie was, like, the character writing. Because obviously the acting is, you know, really good, um, and I don't want to, you know, discredit anyone in that sense, but... You have to cut this out if I'm wrong, but keep it in if I'm right. I think the main actress is Florence Pugh. Does that sound right? It is Florence Pugh. Yes, I nailed it. She does such a good job of playing a character who's just grieving as fuck. Like, she is not like a broken person, but she is very much just going through it in this movie. And, like, not in the way where you're like, oh, it's like this really beautiful, like, nice little side. Like, no, like, she's going through it. And her piece of shit boyfriend plays such a punchable bastard. It's amazing. Like, I've always said that characters who can play people who you want to hate are like really special I'm, I'm getting lost in like kind of a ramble just because of how exciting i'm remembering this movie was uh possibly even higher on my list if i had watched it more recently but midsummer was really good uh still a horror movie but at least it's one that's a little bit outside of my comfort zone so my number eight is the cuphead show that is a netflix original it came out i think in the 2020s is when it started and i believe it's three seasons Stylistically, it's one of my favorite recent releases. They based it on the golden age of Disney cartoons, but the humor is modern. And it's also, I believe, based on a video game that came out in the late 2010s that was done, I believe, in also a traditional animation style. They obviously couldn't carry that over for like a longer series like that, but they still kept the look in. They still have flickers come over the screen to make it look like it was done with animation cells. So artistically, it's stunning. It's about two brothers, Cuphead and Mugman. They're both cups. And they have beef with the devil. So it's them doing, like, really goofy, old-style, like, you know, like, that trope where everyone's fighting and they're in a ball of dust and, like, limbs are coming out? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the Cuphead show. And I believe when I was looking up information about it, I found out that brothers were the people who developed it. So two brothers made a story about two brothers. When are we making our video game, Brian? I'm actually still right now coming to terms with the fact that you watched the Cuphead show, because I did not know this. Wait, do you know about the Cuphead show? Oh, I know about the Cuphead show. I, well, I knew about the Cuphead game. Uh, wh really, why are you surprised I... that I've seen this? Well, I just, I, I should know at this point that if it's animated, you've already seen it. That should be something I assume. To quaff Mugman or Cuphead, probably. Why I oughta... I'm going to take oh. that out. That was awful. God. No, no, um, you, you <laughs> have to keep that in. Very important. <laughs> Sorry. Um, please take us away to number seven. Seven for me, Train to Basan. Um, Ooh. Yeah, it was... I, I mentioned how with the Yellow Jackets, I, I find the medium of, like, survival, horror, whatever you want to call that, Lost in the Woods, it's been done a lot. Um, I don't always find it to be super interesting by its own and i feel like zombie movies is that on steroids the genre itself is just so 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 bloated and there's just so much going on 
that I, I was very kind of hesitant to give this a go. Entirely worth it. It's not a zombie movie that's great. It is a great movie that just also happens to, I guess, have zombies in it. The character writing, the acting, like the different story threads that kind of tie together all just literally on a train for the most part you know in a few stations and docks at like it really is wonderful it's also really along with rrr from last year making me think that i need to do a much better effort to kind of expand and, and start watching more foreign movies as well um because it was just amazing um it's also a movie that doesn't really pull its punches. Uh, I mentioned that with Evil Dead Rise. I think by the time I got to the end of this, I was actually surprised at really how down it made me feel, even though there's really a lot of kind of beautiful character interactions and redemption stories and things like that. But all in all, I would say that if you are maybe dissuaded from the kind of action zombie type movie, this is totally worth watching. I cried a whole lot right at the end I and mean, also a couple of times throughout the middle. You're on seven. You have to oh, shit, you have to I'm tell sorry. us about your number seven. Brian, I'm gonna I'm gonna paint a little picture for you. You you have your brushes. I feel like we need to be funnier. This is you like have, wait, what wait, happened wait, wait, to us. Shannon, 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 Shan, you have your brushes. I have my brushes, Brian. You have you have your canvas. I have my canvas, Brian. Alright, all right. do you have your easel? I have my easel. Okay, now is your easel like angling perhaps natural light like a window or porch, or are you using like the fluorescence above? So I'll make sure we have everything covered here before you get into this picture that you're painting for us. All right. To paint a picture, you walk into the movie theater, you go up, and you, s you spend an exorbitant amount of money on popcorn, maybe some peanut M&Ms. I know those are your favorite. A nice cherry Coke. You go into the theater. You sit down. You get a nice cushiony seat. You, you picked a nice seat ahead of time. It's in the middle of the road towards the back. You're watching the screen. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem comes on, and you're thinking, this is a cute movie. But there's no way the Hey Yay 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 song by Slack Circus on YouTube could possibly be part of the official soundtrack. You'd be wrong. Wait, so you had me up until the point, the Hey Yay 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 song, because you have just described my every movie experience. The, the one where He-Man's like, in that track! Oh, no, wait, no it's not. And I remember hearing it and I was thinking, oh, like, this is so nice. But unfortunately, I much prefer the Slack Circus version on YouTube as opposed to the actual song. Then I heard Skeletor's voice and I was like, there's no way they're actually playing this. They did. That was part of the soundtrack. That's phenomenal. I only heard like the last little bit of what you were saying because it was blasting in my ears in full volume. <laughs> <Just it. laughs> when i tell you that is my most repeated workout song when i'm at the gym i can't get pumped unless i'm listening to that there is this other joke where like some bad guy or something was like going around them in circles and one of them just goes oh my god he's tokyo drifting around us i uh, i'm and i'm just like spitballing but it sounds like this is like the first time somebody who was roughly in that era of of humor was like oh now i'm taking that as like the primary source of what i'm gonna throw into this movie it, it really did. Like, humor was definitely the heart of it. And the way they went about it was really interesting because the style of speaking was very natural. Like, there were parts they'd talk over each other. There were some awkward silences or phrasings. And the way they did it, it just made the jokes hit harder because they felt a lot more natural and not as, like, saged or sitcom adjacent. They were also, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This was the first time they actually sounded and looked like teenagers. So that impressed me. The animation, unfortunately, this came out the same year as Across the Spider-Verse, so obviously the animation is going to take a backseat in terms of how much appreciation it's getting. But the way it was styled was so sketch-like. But overall, like animation, top tier, humor, top tier, star-studded voice cast, and just solid movie. I feel like the lesson could have been like, I don't know, I, don't, I guess I don't need a lesson, I'm 25, but excellent film. Matt showed me, my buddy Matt, who I live with, uh, showed me recently his VHS tape that he had of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I feel like I'd seen it before. So I'm going to say it to you, Shannon, someone who also lived in the same household as me with the same VHS tapes, and I want to see if you'll remember this episode. And it's Raphael is going to a party on a boat, and then like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle girl with like a tail shows up. Oh my god! And starts fighting <laughs> alongside him, and then like that's like the episode there's like a guy with like another ship who takes it hostage do you do you remember this or no why no i i don't remember the story at all like when you're talking about them on a boat i don't yeah but i remember there being a female turtle who was like one of them but bimbified yeah it was like a lizard person it was just 
Matt threw it on, and he didn't believe me, because I have a notoriously bad memory. So I was watching it, I'm like, oh my god, I remember this. And he's like, no, you don't, you're making that up. I'm like, I know I do. Like, we definitely had that VHS tape somewhere. Wait, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Raphael, girl. <laughs> oh, 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 I shouldn't have typed that in. Never Save mind. Save Sir Fun. Save Sir Sean. <laughs> Save Sir Sean. <laughs> okay, you know what? Let's just keep moving. I don't want to think about what I just saw. That's amazing. Six for me. My second entry that is not a horror film, I guess, is about time. Oh my god. Um I'm not going to apologize for it. Uh I'm not gonna feel bad about it. It is just like a Hallmark movie with extra steps, I think. It also raises a lot of questions about how moralistically this guy uses his ability to teleport through time because that's what the movie's about, folks. I'm setting that aside for the narrative. The movie doesn't want to engage in that deeper thought line, so I'm not gonna. But yeah, no, About Time is literally just a movie where this guy and all of the dudes in his family lineage have the ability to go into a dark space, close their eyes, and travel to different instances in time. I guess the explanation is that they live through those moments and then go back to the present day. Like, they don't, like, relive all that time up until the present day again, they just jump back, I guess, afterwards. Uh, but, like, you know, the timeline does change. Uh, it's a lot to work with, and I think the movie does a pretty good job of staying kind of cutesy and wholesome, but then it kind of starts to layer in a little bit and takes some heavier punches, and I don't know if I wasn't just paying attention and it, like, warmed its way into my heart, or if I was, like, sitting there the whole time, like, actively just being like, you know what, this is actually really cute and, like, funny and I like the characters, but then, like, you get to the end and they hit you with some of the heavier punches, and I remember I was on a Discord call when, like, the movie finished, and, like, I had the mic moved away from my face because I was literally sobbing. I was, like, crying at the end of this movie in some of the last scenes, and, like, it's what I imagine people probably experience when they watch, like, rom-coms normally, and I think maybe I should start trying to do that because I had a really Really good time with this one if there's anyone still listening at this point in the video please drop some rom-com recommendations for my brother down below hit me with it all right my number six piggybacking off of last year's number one is adventure time fiona and cake this is good because i feel like you have a working knowledge of adventure time just because of proximity to me michaela oh my god that's so funny i put in my notes to paint a picture but i'm absolutely not doing that again the only picture that's painted in my mind right now is Fiona and Cake from Shrek, if you know what I'm saying. I, if you know what I'm saying. I can't right now. Brian, do you already know what I've seen about Raphael? I can't keep you, doing you, this. You know, Shannon, just real quick, Google. <laughs> Google. <laughs> Fiona's Cake Shrek. Fiona's Cake Shrek, and I'm sure it'll be normal, probably. You can't. You can't trust the internet. So, obviously, Fiona and Cake are the gender-bent versions of Finn and Jake, but the whole thing, this is a 10-episode spinoff, and the whole time it's following Fiona, Cake, and Simon through all these different universes where they can pay little homages to certain parts of the original series while Simon's grappling with some, like, internal stuff. And the thing that really impressed me about this show, because Simon is one of my favorite characters from the original series, is that they touched on his one fault that they never really mentioned directly in the show his fiance girlfriend lady i don't remember like what they were she gave up her entire career for him and they never touched on it but that's kind of they show the ramifications of this and him dealing with his guilt and grief it gutted me it was beautiful and the whole thing is him finding out how to cope with his sadness and fiona learning how to romanticize the unromantic and understanding that there are things in every single person's life that are more beautiful than they seem and also, Brian David Gilbert voiced a character. Dude, he's been getting into voice acting. He has a phenomenal I, voice. I do. I hope he does more. He's definitely not anywhere on my list at all. Don't worry about it. If you are implying what I think you are implying, and that is in your top five. You'll see. Uh, and I think it might be. What I will say is whenever you talk about Adventure Time stuff or Fiona and King stuff, it kind of sounds like when people would talk about, like, really early mytho mythos and mythology from like different cultures and it's just like this like off the wall shit wow all right can you usher us into what i believe is number five the top five yeah so my number five that i picked is exorcist the original exorcist uh from way back i have a fun theme or trend in my life where someone will bother me for a very long time to watch the original of a horror franchise or like an old classic then i put it off 
Then I watch it. I'm like, wow, that's one of the best things I've ever seen. Why have I waited so long to watch it? It's happened with so many movies. Very much the case with this. To show how tough this entire list was, I believe at one point I was considering not including it, and at a different point I was considering including it as my number one pick. So it's kind of right there in the middle. I feel like it ended up in a good spot. It's hard to explain it without the context of the time period. When The Exorcist came out, it was like, unheard of to put what they put in that movie you know into film or at the very least in such a mainstream film like i'm sure there's always the case of other artists and people who maybe didn't get as much credit trying it out beforehand but be that as it may uh the exorcist itself still holds up today uh it spends a lot of time building it is a slow burn throughout most of the film uh and it leads up to maybe a 15 20 minute scene like right at the end where everything kind of pays out um during the exorcism itself and the entire time you're watching and just really being unsure of what's coming next. This girl is kind of becoming more and more of a demon. Priests and, you know, uh, religious workers they bring in to kind of uh, tackle the issue or seeming less and less in control of the situation. And by the time you reach the end of the movie, uh, you've grown to really kind of appreciate everything it's been working with and toward. And I think it's tough because over the course of time, it loses that context of when it came out and what it did kind of for horror. But I still think it holds up, like even in a vacuum. My notes, a recent sequel slash remake came out and was met with a lot of controversy. I've not yet seen it. Um, I've been told it's kind of mid. Not sure. I uh, have to wait to form my own opinion on that. But if someone was let down or gave that a shot and wasn't a big fan and you've yet to see the original, I would really, really recommend going and giving it a shot because it's a, it's a good time. Starting with my top five. Three Busy Debras, live action. Essentially, it's about three rich, caring coded housewives named Deborah. They are not good people. None of this is supposed to be teaching us any lessons. It's just them being very awful, doing awful things in this weird, surrealist place where nothing makes sense. And what I loved was that they would do all these horrible things. They would be very campy. And then randomly, they'd drop something super heavy in there. And I think if there's one episode I have to point to, I would say Deb Springer, which is when the Debras go on Rumspringer, essentially. It just kind of shows how they could be happier. They don't like their current situation. They don't like being housewives. And I don't think this is supposed to, because I know we get in that dangerous territory of, like, not valuing the work of people who are, like, stay-at-home spouses or parents. But I don't think it's criticizing that. I think it's criticizing affluent suburbia and how none of these characters ever really thought to sit down and ask themselves what they wanted. But I'm not going to try to sell this as a deep show. It's very goofy for the most part. That's it. I actually didn't have a lot to say about that. I, was, I don't remember which episode I saw. I remember it was the one where she was picking a new pool boy. <laughs> that's the first episode, yeah. Oh, well, that's the one I saw. I also do want to say that I think what's cool is the concept was created by the three actresses playing the Debras. They were a comedy trio, and they thought it was a funny skit, and it just was so popular that it got the funding to become a show. So it's nice when the writers and like the creators are also in the show. All right. My number four is MNS. M. Night Shyamalan actually's uh, Knock at the Cabin, which did come out this year, 2023. It is hard to explain how I feel about this movie because I've heard so much about the book now and like what the story maybe could have been. And I think to myself, wow, that sounds like really better than like what we got. But the thing is, what we got, I thought was actually really, really, really cool. I think he gets a lot of heat, rightfully so, for the Avatar one. Everything else, you know, hit or miss. I think a lot of storytellers, or whatever you want to call them, have a lot of flops. They have a lot of good movies, and we kind of get to like appreciate the fact that there's both. I think he kind of got a bad reputation, even though he's done some really good work, just because of a couple silly movies or gaffes or whatever you have, and kind of became low-hanging fruit because of that. Uh, this movie really shows, I think, not a return to form, but at, at least for me, recentered the concept that there's really some cool stuff out there uh, that, you know, he can make. And I would say that the parts of this movie that are so cool are the unknown. So this movie is very straightforward in as much as it can be, where there is a, um, a couple and their daughter who are going on like a little vacation uh, to a cabin in the woods. Different horror movie, but still really good. But <laughs> they're going to a cabin in the woods. While they're there, they're visited by these four armed, kind of like really ragtag, miscellaneous group of people. Like they don't really seem to have much knowledge of one another or like any sort of set background. And these four people tell them, hey, we've been like visited by visions and kind of premonitions that the apocalypse is going to happen. And the only way the apocalypse is going to not happen is if one of you kills another one of you, more or less does like a blood sacrifice of like your family member or whatever. 
And throughout the movie, the cadence picks up because as more and more things kind of come into vision of it being like, oh, we, there's these kind of global phenomena happening. Is that real? Is it made up? What's going on? Are these people really seeing these events before they happen? Um, is it coincidence? Are they making it up? And I, I just think it really sells itself on the character acting. Dave Bautista's in this one. And up until this movie, not only was I, again, being a little bit down on my boy M. Night Shyamalan, but I was also very much not tired of Dave Bautista. I just had seen him in a lot of movies and things where I felt like, oh, like he just kind of plays the same guy or whatever. His character is such like, a soft, charismatic, convincing dude in this movie that I was just blown away. Um, and I have to issue my formal apology to Dave Bautista because I think he actually had exhibited some really good acting chops in this one. I'm not going to say any more because I don't want to spoil anything, but Knock at the Cabin is very obvious by the end, you know, kind of what was going on. It doesn't really leave a lot up for interpretation in that way. Also, I already forget what number we're on. I'm so sorry. Uh, I just did four, so I think you're also on. Four, okay. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <laughs> sorry, I had too much wine. This was bad. Bird Girl! I want to do the, the tune. Bird Girl fucks. I feel like you've entered a third item into the lexicon of things you shouldn't type into Google <laughs> because you'll be sad about what you find out. Oh god, okay. I'm not even going to pretend to understand the pre-existing content that led to this TV show. It goes all the way back to Hanna-Barbera cartoons with um, Birdman, the character, and then that eventually created harvey birdman attorney at law tldr this is about bird girl also known as judy ken seven whose father recently passed away the only reason i watched this is because the titular bird girl is voiced by none other than frankie from community and she slays so hard i love frankie from community i think she killed this role but this is one of those shows where some of the main characters do things that are, like, not great. But the real gem of the show is Gillian, with a hard J, who is her valley girl assistant who takes the job way too seriously. That's going to be really funny when next year my top ten list is just exactly your top ten list from this year. And I don't even have to do any work. All right. Here's my three. Now, Shannon, you and I had a conversation about this movie before we hit the end of the year. Hmm. Uh, because I was like, hey, Shannon, I really am going to try not to watch this movie, because if I do, it's going to have to go on my list, probably, and then it's going to knock other stuff off, and I don't want that right now. But then I, I did not have any self-control, and I watched the movie, I want to oh. say, like, with a week left of the year, probably. Uh, Godzilla minus one. Which, I'm going to get the, the mucky stuff out of the way first. Remember earlier when I talked about All Quiet on the Western Front, and I was like, this movie did a really good job of being like, war is bad, and like, you know, no one should be excited about that. Yeah. The movie itself has a lot of that kind of like, ah, we're soldiers, you know, we're guys who fought in the war, we, we you know, we got this going for us, and they kind of like, you know, band together under that, and like, even the United States loves going crazy in their old war movies, and be like, ah, oh, we're American soldiers, we only do good stuff, like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch out for that stuff, man. That being said, you set that aside, this movie fucks. Uh, I want you to Google Godzilla fucks, Shannon, because that's what this movie does, okay? My hand was on my phone, I hate you. <laughs> you were going to google it. well i thought it was gonna be like a remember how last year you're like look up shin godzilla he's so cute with his guts coming out and i thought it was gonna oh. be like one of those okay shin godzilla is really cute and that's maybe an important contextualization is that that's still my favorite godzilla movie this one almost dethroned it it was close this is a much more traditional film though compared to shin godzilla which was kind of weird it follows a uh, pilot who was supposed to be a kamikaze pilot uh, during the final days of World War II, whose plans get upended uh, because, number one, the war ends. Number two, Godzilla shows up. And this entire movie is this guy coming to terms with how his life has impacted others, like, you know, losing people around this time. And again, like, you know, obviously there's also the civilian side of, you know, everything that happened in Japan. I don't want to face that either. Like, you know, this movie really doesn't shy away from that, uh, you know, to its credit. And it's just this kind of, like, little inspirational piece and i don't know i just found it so interesting because nowadays i feel like a lot of the western hemisphere you know godzilla movies are you know godzilla shows up there's a lot of crazy monster fighting and then it lacks scale or maybe impact i feel like in this one when godzilla shows up and is like walking through a town or like activating one of his new abilities or like shooting off a fucking laser blast like the movie will take five minutes just to make you know like oh 
anything that gets in the way of Godzilla is fucked. Like, it is this intimidating, powerful feeling, and it's coming out of what is, like, one of the smallest Godzillas that we've seen in recent times. Like, he's not that big, right? But he feels menacing. How many, and, how many stories tall would you say? Um, there's, you know, spoilers a little bit again. Some... Godzilla size changes and also some considerable like time movement in the movie like it kind of you know recurs a little bit looking it up he's about 164 feet tall so we're gonna say what like 16 stories yay large so, like he is big like he's still a Godzilla size Godzilla but like I know for a fact compared to other Godzillas he's a little tinier he's, he's a slim down boy but similar to Train to Busan I'm actually gonna say a really great movie because it doesn't put like the Godzilla stuff first which maybe is more what I'm talking about missing the mark with some of the newer Godzilla movies that have come out elsewhere it's more just about the characters in the movie what they have going on and like what Godzilla represents to them really specifically to the main guy some of the stuff they do in this movie to Godzilla to try to stop him or like you know like the, the whole big plan they kind of hatch is just like this real just fun and engaging final act. I, I really think that the movie is solid from start to finish, but it's one of those ones where like it doesn't really lose you kind of as time goes on. It kind of keeps building up to the next thing. As an avid Godzilla fan, I am biased, but I've talked to a number of people, even outside of that kind of circle, and, and everyone I know who's seen this did not regret it, so definitely worth watching. As long as he's moderately cute, because Shin Godzilla looked really cute. Shin Godzilla is a, a little baby, and I love him. Did he, like, kill people? Oh, yeah. Oh. Loads. Hmm. Well, I guess I can support a queen. Number three for me is Bojack Horseman. And I was putting off watching this for a while because I think I was wrongfully associating the show with the few people who have seen it and maybe not defend all of what he does, but some of it. You are not supposed to watch this and root for Bojack. That is something you have to be aware of going in. I think most people are. Uh, first off, the animation did worm its way into my heart. It's nothing crazy, but the texture of some of the designs is pretty impressive. The characters, both good and bad, all work together really well. They highlight all of the different parts of Hollywood and the effect that Hollywood has on people. The humor took, I believe, most of the first season for me to get into, but after that, I feel like it was nonstop funny until the end of season six. It does a great job of when we talk about reasons versus excuses. It gives reasons for almost everything, and it never excuses behavior. That leads into my favorite part of the show, which is any episode that relates to Bojack and his parents, who are voiced by Will Arnett and Wendy Malick. Here you see kind of how Bojack's upbringing affected the course of his life, but the show again never fails to remind the audience that just because he has all these reasons to be shitty, they are not excuses to be shitty. And his parents suck, but every episode they're in is so well written. And there are also a few uniquely framed episodes. It kind of reminds me of Community, how they sometimes shift their medium to keep things, like, upbeat. I know there's an episode where therapists are discussing their clients, but they're trying to, like, keep up confidentiality, so they're talking about them as different characters. So they have, like, thinly veiled disguises. There is one episode where the entire thing is just Bojack giving a eulogy. And then there's an episode where they don't use, like, voice acting at all. It's all silent. So it's, it's very clever. It's very witty. It's profound. And I was getting so nervous at the end that they were going to cower away from what they were going towards. And I thought if they had, it would have completely ruined the show for me. But they didn't chicken out, and I think that's what made this so exceptional. All right. You finally made it, Shannon. You got to where you wanted to be. Oh, no. Number two is Brian David Gilbert in Dance's movie. Oh, my God. I knew it. Actually, I want to make sure I do appropriate credit. I'm pretty sure this was actually a series written by, or at least worked on, uh, by Laura Catherine Gilbert, uh, who is one of his siblings. Um, so BDG obviously plays the titular character, and, you know, I'm sure had a hand in some of the stuff, but I want to make sure everyone is accredited here, because this thing is a masterpiece. And I am not using that word lightly. For anyone who hasn't seen it or doesn't know, uh, who might be familiar with Brian David Gilbert more through his work at Polygon, or just general other YouTube shenanigans, it is a short video series uh, on YouTube, and it's very clearly supposed to be a little funny. Like, oh, it's a you know short video series, a couple of minutes per episode, where Brian David Gilbert does a silly dance and teaches you how to do dance styles, right? Like high knees or arm shaking or the worm or whatever. So different kind of you know little bits. But one of the things that's so cool is that it breaks its medium, or maybe it's like you could call it alternative storytelling. And 
it's one of those things, I think this was the same uh, as last year, where the more I say about this, the more I'm going to ruin it for somebody. Like, you really should go in blind and take my word for it. So anyone who wants to do that, pause or jump to the next section. Shannon will put a time code in right here. Bam. Thanks, Shannon. For anyone who doesn't uh, care about that, it starts to tell a story in the background, right, with these characters who are in this silly YouTube video series that's supposed to just kind of be dumb fun. And... I don't know if I'm just blowing something that I shouldn't out of proportion, but I found it to be so surprising, and I think that's maybe where it catches you off guard. Like, you're instantly like, oh, that's weird. I didn't realize they were going to go in this direction. That seems like a really weird take or choice. And then you get to the last episode where, like, you kind of watch this small arc happen in the background of this little dumb dance series, and you feel genuine emotion about it. It kind of gets to, like, a really low place, and I think it does a really successful job of getting to a really low place such that when you see the last video um, and you see everything come together literally and kind of, you know, metaphorically, when he strings all these different dances together and kind of mirrors, I think, some sort of emotional acceptance of the character. You know, I I don't even really know necessarily. I'm just kind of spitting word soup because it evokes so many emotions all at once. Um, I mentioned earlier watching, you know, a full rom-com and crying a lot at the end. I was, like, crying significantly at the end of BDG's Dances Moving, a stupid YouTube video by Brian <laughs> Gilbert and his sister, Laura Gilbert, where I was like, oh, I did not expect that to come out of nowhere, and the entire thing takes like, maybe 15, 20 minutes to get through, so I was just so blown away and so caught off guard, and I love when certain mediums are taken, and there's, like, a bit of a subversion, or maybe kind of, like, a, a change in form, or a breakage of form, and... This did such a good job of that, that I really just could not not put it right near the top of my list. You told me to watch it, and I threw it on. Tears are streaming down my face. All right, what is your number two? Oh, shoot, I didn't even scroll down. Oh, this should be number one. It should be. Across the Spider-Verse. It is phenomenal. The animation, this is the prime example of how waiting ruby-length durations for certain things will give you great quality, unlike Ruby. The level of detail included in the plot's impressive. There are callbacks to things that were put in the first movie. The voice acting is amazing. The humor is amazing. The action, it's like every aspect of it was fine-tuned to such an impressive degree, and everything they added, added. Nothing was added for no reason. No characters were unnecessary. I loved the theme, and I feel like Spider-Man has been exploring the idea of being a hero in a way that not many other movies have. I don't typically love Marvel films. I've seen some, but the ones that I love the most are Spider-Man because it's always just some kid who's trying to figure it all out. And should you have to give up everything to be a hero? Should you have to sacrifice everything you love to fill that role? And I feel like it was this whole concept of Miles trying to say he could have his cake and eat it too. And Mikhail actually pointed out there's that one scene where he wants to write so much of the cake that he ends up having to get two cakes. Was it meant to be that deep? I think so. I just wanted to brag that I got to see a live orchestra accompanied showing of the original Into the Spider-Verse, and it was so cool. As we spoke about previously, I purposefully did not put this on my list. Rather, I felt okay not putting it on my list to make room for others because I knew you were gonna, which feels greedy of me. I get it. I, I wombo comboed, so you're allowed. You wombo comboed, but I was like, oh, I should really get across the Spider-Verse in here. And then I was like, oh, well, Shannon's definitely going to talk about it. So, Well, did you have anything to add? We have, we have the time. This is going to sound weird. I don't know if it's everyone's favorite take. And also, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there's plenty of people who feel this way. I'm not special. But I still think at the end of the day, when more time passes, I'm going to feel that Into the Spider-Verse is the better of the two movies. Not for, like, grand reasons or anything like that. I just think it's... A more straight. I mean, it's hard when you have a story that's following up another story, and then also you have to split it in two because, like, we both know, and everyone who is watching this probably knows, like, it doesn't just end. It's going to be leading into a third movie. You know, you have a lot more to work with. Um, you have a lot more hurdles to kind of overcome. I feel like the first one captures like a bit more of a simple story. It's more of like a origin than it is, you know, a complicated, more like emotionally demanding, like complex themed. You know, really just like this big undertaking that they did. So. I loved Across the Spider-Verse. I thought it was amazing. I am also going to say that the animation and sound and design definitely even were improvements upon the first. And here comes number one. My number one is Joe Para Talks With You. Joe Para Talks With You is... Well, it's it's written and made by Joe Para, And it is just about this, like, 
I'm trying to think of the best word to describe this man. I think he's just comfortable. It's just this comfortable dude who's just telling you about stuff. Like, one episode might be about him talking about breakfast, and the entire episode is just him talking about, you know, what you might order at a classic diner, and, like, why one option is good or another, and it starts out like that. And so the first time my friend showed it to me, I was like, oh, this is funny. Like, you know, he's got, like, a kind of awkward, like, you know, I guess you'd call it, like, alternative comedy or something, right? Or, like, awkward comedy. And by the end of, like, the third or fourth episode, like, you know, as is, you know, the theme with me, I was, like, bawling. And, like, it wasn't even for story reasons, because the show does eventually kind of develop more of an actual plot. It's just something about this man and his appreciation, or at least, like, expression of appreciation for the world we live in and some of the funny little bits of it that I don't think we really think about that often. Something I'm going to circle back to, I don't know if it was something we talked about during our, like, anime rewatch, but do you remember Nananbiori? Of course I remember Nananbiori. It's very clear that specifically the animators and, like, artists who kind of worked on it had this, like, love for the countryside that they just really poured into the work and it was kind of so apparent even though nothing was ever really said about it, right? Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about everything in the show. Whether or not it's the character, whether or not it's really Joe Para, there's something about the way he just engages so earnestly and genuinely with everything he talks about that opens the door for it to be funny, that opens the door for the eventual arcs in the show to kind of be heartfelt and like heartwarming or maybe even a little sad. It's not really just on the nose. Again, a lot of it's just left for you to kind of like read into and enjoy. And if you don't watch the show, listen to his comedy. Go find his specials or whatever. He has a podcast um, you should check out. Like, everything he does is somehow in character, but also, like, never quite what you expect. And it just, one of those things where it inspires me to maybe want to try to be a better person, or maybe a more engaged person, I don't really know, but this show is like wearing a blanket, is the best way I can describe it. And everyone should try it out, at least a little bit. It's really good. See, the problem now is that you should have ended because you just did a love letter to the mundane, and I'm about to do a hate letter to the mundane. I have actually Seinfeld as number one. Oh no! So obviously this was in our house lot when we were growing up. Our parents both watched it. We knew all of the jokes from it, but I never did a full watch through. I haven't seen all the episodes. And in the way that Three Busy Debras is about bad people who have brief moments of genuine connection, that doesn't exist here. There is not one moment in this series that tugs on any genuine emotion, and I love that. They commit to having the most surface level. It's not, I would say, as intense as It's Always Sunny. Like, they aren't that bad, but they're bad in the sense that they are always so bitter about the monotony of daily life. It's about all the things you hate that people do, the loud talkers, the close talkers. They do a whole bunch of different things that are so specific. But the fact that this series came out in 89, I want to say it ended in 99, so it was like a nine-season, ten-year runabout. Some episodes obviously didn't age well, that's going to happen with most older sitcoms, but compared to the other sitcoms airing at that time, I think the content aged really well because it's not about pop culture, it's about things that are so inherently human. And obviously things like tape recorders or not having caller ID, like those don't last, but you still get the humor behind it. The acting, we talk about the lovable bastard archetypes a lot. It's very JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but that's definitely the type of characters working here. And I think what I appreciated was Elaine's writing was weirdly ahead of its time, not because she was so in-depth or interesting, but because they made her as reprehensible as the guys. And usually the female characters surrounded by doofuses are meant to be the responsible, logical, emotionally intelligent ones. But she's just as disgusting and rude as the others. She does not want to have any deep relationships with the men she's with. And I feel like to have a character like that, it's so refreshing. The delivery of the lines. There's something just so unique about how the show only focuses on the smallest things. But they manage to make like 30 minute episodes about it. Um, I'm going to just take one quick second and just challenge you. Okay. Because you said it was kind of like a hate letter to the mundane. I'm going to disagree. I think, you know, knowing is loving. And I think that this show kind of documents the human experience so specifically in such a weird way. Where it's like, hey, here's that one thing that, if you think about it, is kind of funny or dumb. And, like, puts it in the spotlight. Because otherwise you never think about it or really give it the time of day, right? 
Yeah. And like you said, it kind of takes these small little moments of the human experience and just kind of cemented them a little bit more permanently in comedy, which is always a good thing. That's a good way of looking at it because it really does act as a time capsule for the 90s, but it also is something that transcends time. And it really is just like the everyday things. And I love everyday things. Well, Shannon, if one thing has become readily apparent, it's that we've become a lot less funny with age. Yeah, that really sobers a person up. I've been thinking it for a while, but your, your YouTube channel has just been on the decline. I really hope that my presence helps kick it back off. You're the star. I'm just here for it.